Dr. J here. Today starts a series of videos on Dr. Bart Ehrman, and this series may not be what you think it will be. Sometimes Christians come to the stage with certain motivations to disprove whatever Ehrman says, regardless of his intent or the merit of his claims. I'm a Christian theologian, but I'll be offering what I hope to be a charitable yet accurate understanding of Ehrman's beliefs. He's written a lot, and this video series will only cover so little. Back in 2019, I had the opportunity to meet Ehrman upon his willingness to speak at the Defenders Conference, the theme of which was Gospel Differences. Defenders Conference? Why would Ehrman speak at an Evangelical Christian Apologetics Conference? Well, we brought Ehrman on stage with three Christian intellectuals, Mike Lacona, Craig Keener, and Rob Bowman, each of them to present and discuss their respective positions. At Veracity Hill, we're not afraid to tackle the difficult concerns that leave doubters in question or despair. And that includes providing a fair description and analysis of people who do not consider themselves Christians, Bart Ehrman included. This autumn, I have thoroughly read Ehrman's most popular book, Misquoting Jesus, published back in 2005. Ehrman found himself on NPR radio two times in the same week, an extreme rarity, and a Washington Post interview a few months later led him to appear on Jon Stewart's The Daily Show. The book topped the charts at the New York Times and was a bestseller on Amazon. As I recall his own account of it to me two years ago, it really was luck that brought Ehrman a sort of stardom. Misquoting Jesus is a pop-level introduction to an otherwise dry field of study, textual criticism. Textual criticism in biblical studies is the field of study devoted to determining the original wording of the Bible. The first four chapters are fairly straightforward, providing the backgrounds of the Christian religion as a religion of the book, a history of scribal work, a history of formal texts of the New Testament, and a history of modern textual criticism. It's in chapters 5, 6, and 7 that delve into Ehrman's position on some of the textual variants, variants which were likely theological, theologically motivated, according to his view. These differences pertain to how Jesus is depicted, doctrinal disputes, role of women in society, and Jewish relations, to name a few of the categories. The final chapter concludes the book reviewing the material and Ehrman's conclusions. At first ponder, what could be so controversial about textual criticism? Craig Blomberg of Denver Seminary wrote, most of misquoting Jesus is actually a very readable, accurate distillation of many of the most important facts about the nature and history of textual criticism, presented in a lively and interesting narrative that will keep scholarly and lay interest alike. The data is the data. Manuscripts are manuscripts. Indeed, there are discussions about what the original wording of the New Testament said, but are such differences so significant as to cast hard skepticism of the original wording of the New Testament. In Misquoting Jesus, Ehrman described his spiritual journey. He spent three years at Moody Bible Institute, completed his bachelor's at Wheaton College, and did graduate level work at Princeton Theological Seminary. It was at Wheaton College that he began learning Greek and became fascinated with textual criticism. He found himself asking a basic question. How does it help us to say that the Bible is the inerrant word of God if, in fact, we don't have the words that God inerrantly inspired, but only the words copied by the scribes? Sometimes correctly, but sometimes, and many times, incorrectly. He further wondered about how it was meaningful to talk of the doctrine of inspiration if we do not have the originals. These doubts plagued him and he reached a tipping point in his second semester at Princeton. He wrote a paper trying to defend an alleged error in Mark chapter 2, which has Jesus saying that Abiathar was the high priest when King David ate the bread at the temple. The trouble here is that 1 Samuel 21 tells us it was Ahimelech, Abiathar's father. As much as he tried to argue that there was no error, Ehrman's professor wrote, maybe Mark just made a mistake. And for Ehrman, his own agreement with that statement opened the floodgates. The house of cards came falling down. Once I made that admission, the floodgates opened. For if there could be one little picayune mistake in Mark 2, maybe there could be mistakes in other places as well. Beyond listing candidates for errors, Ehrman goes on to explain how his view of inerrancy led him to his skepticism of inspiration. It is one thing to say that the originals were inspired, but the reality is that we don't have the originals. 
So saying they were inspired doesn't help me much, unless I can reconstruct the originals. Since the originals do not exist, it becomes something of a moot point. And further on, this became a problem for my view of inspiration, for I came to realize that it would have been no more difficult for God to preserve the words of Scripture than it would have been for him to inspire them in the first place. These thoughts brought Ehrman to shift his thinking that the Bible was a very human book. In short, textual criticism was a factor in Ehrman's departure from evangelical Christianity and the Christian religion but it was not the only factor in his departure from the Christian religion. In other works, Ehrman references the problem of evil and suffering. In Misquoting Jesus, he does describe his journey by incorporating theological doctrines that he believed. So I think it would be fair to say that his departure from Christian belief altogether was the collection or relationship between textual criticism, theology, and philosophical reflection. That is, certain inferences being made. In spite of his personal journey away from Christianity, Ehrman is one of the most well-respected textual critics alive today. When it comes to the manuscripts and debates surrounding them, Ehrman knows his stuff. Having read Misquoting Jesus, I've come to realize that sometimes scholars have not given Ehrman's book a fair shake. In some instances, they will accuse him of making provocative, vague statements or of holding to conclusions he does not hold. In my next video, I'll describe these remarks, providing a response that gives Ehrman his due, and present a nuanced take on why Ehrman wrote and at other times speaks as he does. Stay tuned for my next video by subscribing to my channel, following my socials, or go to veracityhill.com to get email updates.